Okay, let's get started. So um, today is our, our great pleasure to have uh, Professor uh, Jeff Calder from uh, University of Minnesota. Uh, before we get started, let me say a few words about Jeff. Uh, Jeff is an assistant professor in mathematics at, at the University of Minnesota. He uh, completed his PhD degree in 2014 at the uh, University of Michigan, advised by Sunin. Uh, actually, Sunin uh, was the postal of my advisor. <laughs> uh, and Alfred, a hero. And also, uh, uh, Maury, assistant professor at UC Berkeley from uh, 2014 to 2016. So Jeff uh, was awarded an um, Sloan Fellowship very recent this year. Very prestigious award, congratulations. And his research interests are focused on interaction, intersection of the PDE, machine learning, and applied uh, probability, probability. Okay, Jeff, I, so you, I, I give you all the control. Um, okay. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk uh, today about um, a couple of uh, problems in graph-based learning, um, but let me just first um, uh, acknowledge my collaborator. So this is work with my PhD student, Brendan Cook. Um, sorry, I don't know what's going on here. Um, and with uh, uh, also joint work with Dan uh, Slepchev and Matthew Thorpe. Um, and uh, I also acknowledge the NSF and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for uh, supporting the research. So um, I'm going to talk about some problems that have come up recently in graph-based learning when you have very few labeled examples. And there'll be two parts of the talk. One part will be on sort of, uh, will, will be more theoretical looking at what's the lowest label rate we can um, accommodate with some of the popular Laplacian regularizers. Um, and the second part will be on a new algorithm called Poisson learning, um, which works very well to propagate labels on graphs when you have uh, very few uh, labeled training examples. Um, so let me just quickly um, give a brief intro into, uh, into learning theory. So um, lots of people might be familiar with uh, fully supervised learning. Okay, so this is uh, the setting where you have uh, some large amount of training data. So these are uh, data label pairs, xi and yi. Xi's are the uh, data points, and the yi's are the are the labels. And the goal is to learn a function that generalizes the rule that xi maps to yi. So you're learning this function from the data space to the label space, and uh, this could be, say, a deep neural network or something. Um, the case that we'll look at in this talk mostly is semi-supervised learning. So here you're given additionally some possibly very large amount of unlabeled data. Um, and so uh, usually in this setting, you have very few labels, but you have a very large amount of the unlabeled data. And the point is to use the additional data, even though they don't have labels, this, the point is to use some kind of uh, structure or geometry in the unlabeled data to improve the learning task so you can get good results with very few training data. Um, this can be in the inductive setting, like in fully supervised. And here you still learn a general rule that X maps to Y. Um, or what we'll talk about in this talk more is the transductive setting, which is where you don't learn a general rule to classify, but instead you just propagate the labels on the data that you have. So you just learn labels for the additional unlabeled data points. Um, and of course, there's, uh, there's also unsupervised learning, which doesn't use any label information. Um, and this is like clustering algorithms, for instance. So for example, maybe you want to automatically caption an image. So here the data is the image. So say the raw pixel values, the red, green, and blue values in the, in the image, it's a very high dimensional uh, vector. And the labels are the captions for the images. And so you would give a lot of training examples of, of images with captions. And you would train, like say in this paper, they train a deep neural network to learn how to caption new images. And so these are all captions that have been generated automatically by a deep neural network. And you can see they're all fairly, fairly close to being correct or exactly correct, let's say. Um, so we'll talk about semi-supervised learning. Um, and here, one uh, natural way, very commonly used way to uh, encode the structure of the unlabeled data is to build a graph over your data. 
Okay, so a graph has uh, vertices and edge weights. Um, and so we have n vertices x1 through xn, the script x and the script w are, are the edge weights, which are non-negative and uh, symmetric. Um, and the idea here is that the weights should be large, say like order one, if xi and xj are similar, and they should be close to zero if the data points are not similar. And you actually set them to be zero for lots of the pairs i and j, so you get a sparse weight matrix. Yeah. Um, and then in a semi-supervised learning, we have some labels, like I was saying. So the first m data points, let's say, are given labels. Um, m is very small compared to the size of your, of your whole data set. And labels are typically uh, vectors. So if I have k different classes, then each class um, is represented by the, uh, by the standard basis vector with a 1 in, the, in that position. So the basis vector is e1 through ek. These, these are called one-hot vectors in machine learning. So all of these labels are all just one-hot vectors with the corresponding class uh, with the position of the 1 in the corresponding class membership. Um, and so the task is, given these labels, we want to extend them in some meaningful way to the rest of the graph. And so this is like label propagation, is often called. Um, the reason that this is semi-supervised is that the graph, which is built over the labeled and the unlabeled data, it, it's, it encodes the geometry and various uh, uh, different uh, structures in the unlabeled data. And the goal here is that you want to be able to obtain good, um, per, uh, good performance of your classifier uh, with you know using far fewer labels than you would with a fully supervised algorithm. The, the idea being that like the human visual system only needs a small handful of examples to learn a new class. You don't need to see 20,000 images of what a four looks like before you know uh, what fours look like. Okay, so we want to be able to provide only a handful of training examples and get you know good quality classification. So for example, when you build a graph, here's a very simple example of a graph built over a data set that's basically clustered with a small sort of bottleneck bridge between the two clusters. Um, and so here I built the graph with a, a k nearest neighbor graph, which means that every node, I look at its k nearest Euclidean neighbors and I connect them by an edge. Um, and so you get a fairly sparse graph that gives, um, that encodes the, um, um, encodes the geometry of the data fairly well. And what you can think is that, okay, so, you know, this has a natural cluster uh, structure. And so um, if I, for instance, have a point in one class and a point in the other class, you know, there are very few paths that connect those two points because the paths have to go through this bottleneck. Where if I have two paths that are within the same, or if I have two points in the same cluster, there's lots of different paths that can, that can connect these two points. And so these are the sort of ways in which the graph can encode the geometry of the data set. And so you can think about, you know, this is the reason why people like to use diffusion or random walks on graphs to do label propagation, because this, you know, sort of uh, respects the uh, cluster uh, structure of the data set well. Um, so here's an example in practice how you might build the graph. So a very common data set is the, uh, to, to, to work with, you know, sort of like a toy example now, is the MNIST data set. Um, so here I'm showing 100 different images from the MNIST data set. There are 70,000 of these. They're all handwritten digits from 0 to 9. Um, and so each, each digit is a 28 by 28 pixel image. Um, and so you can just think of it as a vector. If you just flatten the pixel values, they're just grayscale pixel values, so they're just numbers. Um, and if you just uh, uh, flatten the pixels into a long array, you get an, an, uh, a point in R784, so a very high dimensional vector. And so we just think of each image as a vector in R784. Then we can compute between images. Um, so between image I and image J, we can just take the Euclidean distance between the two image vectors, uh, divide by a length scale, and apply some decreasing kernel to this, which could be a Gaussian kernel usually. Um, and usually it'll have compact support, so you have some sparse graphs. You cut off at some small, some, some small length scale. Um, more common in practice might be to build a k-nearest neighbor graph, like I was saying before. And so here it's just the same construction, but you would use the, the bandwidth epsilon would be locally adapted to the distance to the kth nearest neighbor. Uh, so what you might want to do with MNIST is like cluster the images, so separate the ones from the twos and threes and so on. Um, and you might want to even do semi-supervised learning where you give some examples of ones, twos, and threes, and you try to train classifiers on this. And so some of the images are easy to separate. So like the ones 
are easy to separate from the zeros, they look quite different, but some of them, like the fours and the nines, look quite similar, and these are harder to uh, separate. So, um, so, this, so this problem of label propagation on a graph, right? Uh, one has to regularize it in some way, because there's no unique way to extend the labels. Um, one of the popular ways to uh, regularize the problem is called Laplacian regularization. So here uh, you have your labels in the first m data points and you extend the rest of the data points by harmonic extension. So you solve graph Laplacians equal to zero subject to uh, the function u has to attain the correct labels at the known uh, label positions. And then so you know notice that this function u is vector valued. We have k classes and these are all one hot vectors for the labels. So when you solve this uh, um, Laplace equation here, you get a vector valued function. And to decide on the class membership or uh, the, the, the class label for each node, you just take the component of u that's largest at each node. Okay. So you basically project to this uh, simplex. Uh, so this was uh, originally proposed in 2003 by Zhu, Garam, and Lafferty. Um, and this has, uh, has influenced a lot of work since. So this paper is cited thousands of times and there's been a lot of follow-up papers. These are just a few, but there are tons of other ones. So it's been used in learning theory, but also in manifold ranking and lots of other kinds of problems. Um, so, you know, one can think of this as label propagation on a, on a graph um, in the following sense. So if I take a function that's harmonic on the graph, so Laplace U is equal to zero, and then I just rearrange this, right? The u of xi, I can pull outside because the sum is over j. So if I rearrange this, I get that, the, uh, that any function that's graph harmonic satisfies the mean value property on the graph. So that says that u of xi is the weighted average of its neighbors. Um, and so this leads you to the label propagation algorithm of Zhu from 2005, which just replaces iteratively uh, u k by, um, by its weighted average of its neighbors. And so when this iteration converges, you get exactly a solution to Laplace learning. So each step here, you also set the labels at the, at the known points. So when, when you hear people talking about label propagation, well, this is the same as Laplace learning. It just refers to a method for computing the solution to Laplace learning. And if you know people who have a PDE background will recognize this as the Jacobi method for, um, for solving Laplace equation, and it's one of the slowest methods you can use to solve the equation. So you should use something like, uh, you know, what would be faster here would be like a precondition conjugate gradient iteration or something. Um, and so uh, finally, there's also the variational interpretation for Laplace learning, where I can say the solution to Laplace learning is the same as the minimizer of the following variational problem. I'm going to minimize the graph Dirichlet energy uh, subject to the labels agreeing at the labeled nodes. And so one should think of this Dirichlet energy here as uh, measuring how smooth the function u is over the graph, where I penalize uh, the non-smoothness, so the difference uxi minus uj, I penalize it more where the labels are larger, so where the data points are more, are more uh, similar. Um, so from a PDE point of view, also think of it as the integral of uh, grad u squared. Of course, there are soft constrained versions. So here I'm forcing the labels to be attained. You can also have soft constrained versions of this, which are better if you have noisy labels, let's say. And so you can add some uh, fidelity in place of the hard constraints, and you can put any loss you like here. So there are lots of algorithms that have been proposed along these lines. Um, so it's something that's been uh, noticed recently, like in the last five or 10 years, and there's been a lot of work in this, in this area, um, is that if I, you know, if I look at Laplace learning, it works fairly well for moderate amounts of labeled data, and I'll show you examples later, but when you look at very, very few labels, like one or two per class or something, then you get results that are kind of like random guessing. They're just completely terrible results. Um, and so here's a nice uh, simulation to see what's going on. Say I have, I, th I, th I think I take like 100,000 points in the box. They're just random variables uniform here. And I connect nearby points to build a graph. And then I put one labeled point on the left side of the box at the red point and one labeled point on the right side, the green point. So the red point gets a value zero, let's say, the green point gets a value one, and then I'm plotting over here the graph of the solution to Poisson learning plotted sort of over the point cloud. And what you end up with is that with these very few labels, like just two labels in this case, the uh, solution is constant, basically almost everywhere it's constant, and you have a sharp spike attached to each labeled point. 
So you're not really propagating labels nicely in this sense. And the way you can see, like, like why is this happening? I go back to the um, uh, variational interpretation. A constant function is free. It has zero energy for the Dirichlet energy. So constant functions are great if you're trying to minimize the Dirichlet energy, but the constant function can't attain the labels. So if I take a constant and add a sharp spike at each label to attain the labels, and now if I have very few labels, the cost of those spikes is not so much, so that it's much cheaper here to take a constant function than it is to uh, smoothly interpolate between the labels. Okay. So this was noticed by Nadler in 2009, but then also by, um, there's been some recent work uh, by Al Aloui and by others and by myself that I'll talk about um, shortly. So just to give you a quick example of how this works on MNIST, which is an easy data set by today's standards, um, if I have hundreds of labels per class, um, I can get very good results. So this is 160 labels per class, so that's 1,600 labels total because I have 10 classes. So I can get 97% accuracy with labeling all the other 70,000 minus 1,600 images. Um, and I'm comparing to a baseline uh, nearest neighbor classifier that uses the graph geodesic distance. Um, but if I really crank down the label rate down to only a handful of uh, labels per class, so one label up to four labels per class, the performance of Laplace learning degenerates really, really quickly. And so I have, you know, um, results that are close to random guessing. If you just guess randomly, you get 10%, right? Okay. And so this is much, much worse than, than the baseline nearest neighbor. So something really bad is going on in this, in this low label rate regime. Um, so uh, this was a, a, a identified by Nadler, as I mentioned, then the last 10 years has seen a lot of work trying to address this. Most of the work has been on new algorithms that uh, smoothly interpolate between the labels. And so some of the first things were higher, higher order regularizers, so taking the sort of mth power of the Laplacian instead of the first power, um, and p Laplacian regularizers. Both of these have theory that show that, uh, that these regularizers, if you take a larger value for p and take higher order powers of the Laplacian, that you'll uh, smoothly interpolate between the labels and you're not going to have spikes forming. Um, and then there are reweighted Laplacians, which I've worked on as well. Um, and here what you're doing is reweighting the graph, so you amplify the weights near the labels to discourage the gradient from being sharp. So you want to have a much smaller gradient near the labels. Um, and there's also the centered kernel method, which is a bit more recent. Um, and uh, this is a completely different idea based on random matrix theory. Um, uh, I won't say much about this one. Um, there are lots of new um, ideas and new models for handling the low label rate regime. But up until the work I'm going to tell you about later in the talk, um, we didn't really know what was so bad about Laplace learning, what went so wrong at these low label rates. And so once you analyze this more closely, um, we'll see that there are much simpler ways to fix the algorithm. Okay, so let's, let's quickly look at the uh, spikes that I've been talking about. So here's an example where I build a graph with 100,000 data points just randomly drawn from the box. Um, and what I'm visualizing here is the solution to Laplace learning, and it's uh, visualized as a triangulated surface. So you triangulate that point cloud, and then you plot you plot the actual uh, surface you get by taking the xy coordinates plus the height plus the value u of x at that point. And what I'm using for my label function that I'm sampling is cosine of x1. So it's so the x1 axis is along this way, if you can see my mouse. And so minus ones are over here, plus ones are over there. If I have only 10 labels per class, I can't really tell it's cosine, but I just have these sharp uh, spikes telling me that I should have a plus one here and minus one down there. If I take 100 labels per class, I can see the profile a bit better, but I still have large uh, spikes at the, at the label data points. And if I take a thousand points uh, as labeled in the box, I, you know the spikes become almost negligible, and I can I can recover the uh, label function a lot more closely. So the question, like the first natural question, is you know how many labels do you need in this kind of problem so you can ensure the spikes don't form and that we accurately uh, uh, recover the label function. So how do you know that you're in the case on the right hand side here with very small spikes and you accurately recover the function versus being in the left hand side where the function is constant and you have these sharp spikes. Maybe the middle is not so bad. I don't know if you're just going to threshold this at you know zero, maybe the middle is not so bad having some spikes that are you know uh, manageable size. Um, 
So uh, the first part of the work, I'll tell you about a theoretical result saying what is the sort of sharp cutoff at which I am in the picture on the right side versus the picture on the left side. Um, the second part, I will, will, will start to analyze more closely you know, why we see such poor classification results when the spikes are present in this very low label rate regime. Is the main questions that hadn't really been asked before is that is it, you know, it was sort of assumed that the spikes are sort of too localized and they don't propagate information. But this was never something that was looked at closely, let's say. And then, it, you know, the other questions are, is it a problem to have this very flat scoring function? Um, you know, these are things that, uh, you know, once you look closely at it, okay, so I'll, we'll talk about this later in the talk, but actually you can think of these spikes, you can think of them as point sources in a graph Poisson equation. Um, and once you understand this, it leads to a new algorithm called Poisson learning, which has spikes like this, but performs very well, even at the very, very low label rates. Okay? And so I will give um, examples on MNIST, Fashion MNIST, and uh, CIFAR 10 later on in the talk. Um, so, uh, right, so the first part is about avoiding the spikes. Okay? So the setting, um, you have to take some model for your graph. And so here we take the random geometric graph. The other possible model you can take is the uh, stochastic block model. Um, and I think some of these um, proofs would hold in that case as well. But uh, you know, I've been working a lot with random geometric graphs because you have geometry here and you have PDEs, which is, which is nice. So this graph model is the, uh, the vertices of the graph um, are an IID sample um, from a positive density function rho on some bounded domain in RD. Uh, and the weights are geometric weights, so I take a decreasing kernel with compact support, and I use the formula from before, that the weights are eta of the distance between xi and xj divided by a bandwidth epsilon. Um, and there are some conditions we place on eta, but these are very simple, just that the compact supports on the unit ball. So. Um, okay, so here's the graph Laplacian from earlier. Um, so it's, 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 well, it's sort of well known by now that the, um, it, the large data limit and the sparse graph limit, so take n to infinity, take the bandwidth of the graph to zero, then the graph Laplacian is consistent with this weighted Laplace operator, where it's weighted by the density rho. Um, and in particular, the papers going back to 2007 by Matthias Hein and others, where, uh, where they basically prove consistency estimates for the normalized graph Laplacian to this weighted plus operator. Actually, they prove this in the manifold setting where you're sampling the points from a from a closed manifold embedded in, in RD, let's say. Um, but this is just a flat setting in this talk. There's a constant that comes up in front of the weighted Laplacian, but the constant depends only on the kernel eta that you chose. That's the only way that eta shows up is this constant. It's like the second moment of eta, essentially. Um, and so this holds with high probability. It's an order epsilon linear rate. Actually, if you, if you work a little bit harder, you can get the second order rate if u is in C4. So what you should be thinking is that the density rho, it controls the rate of diffusion in this operator. So, so you have higher or you, you have faster diffusion in dense regions and uh, slower diffusion in sparse regions, which is perfectly natural. It's a very good uh, thing to have for classification, let's say, because you want labels to propagate fast in the clusters in the dense regions, but to propagate slowly between clusters in the regions that are sparse. You can kind of think of it as like an analog if, if, you're, um, if you've worked in image processing before. There are things like the prona malloc equation or total variation uh, denoising. And so these equations are like nonlinear heat equations where you have variable diffusion. Um, the main difference, though, is that in like Prona Malik, the diffusion depends on the norm of the gradient. So it's a highly nonlinear equation, whereas here the diffusion speed depends on the data density rho, which just sort of comes out of the woodwork when you look at this graph Laplacian. So this is a linear operator, whereas these are nonlinear operators for image processing. Um, so our model for the label data, we're going to take our random geometric graph um, on this domain omega. And we're going to take some fixed subdomain, we'll make a tilde. And within that subdomain, we're going to randomly um, uh, choose some of the points, beta fraction of those points to be labels. So every point will have an IID random variable, uh, which is Bernoulli 0, 1, with probability beta of being a 1. And the ones that are 1s are going to be uh, labeled points. So the red ones here are the labels. There are, on average, beta fraction of those inside 
omega tilde, and then nothing outside of omega tilde gets labeled. And we have the Laplace learning problem where I'm finding the harmonic um, extension of the labels from the red points to the rest of the data set. Uh, and we'll say that our labels are sampled from an underlying Lipschitz function G. Um, and so in the limit, sort of as the number of points goes to infinity and the length scale goes to zero, what you expect to get is that if the red points fill out this set omega tilde densely, you expect to get that un recovers the Lipschitz function g inside here if there are enough labels, a high enough label rate. And outside of that set, you expect to get the PDE in the limit. And this is what we show. So, so the PDE is that, what I was just saying on the previous slide, you get the divergence rho squared grad u is zero outside of omega tilde, you get the Dirichlet condition inside omega tilde, and you get the natural Neumann boundary condition on the uh, boundary of the entire domain. Um, but the key part of the theorem is the lower bound on the label rate that gives you convergence to this PDE. Because right? if, if the label rate's too low, we degenerate into spikes, we don't get anything useful at all. So the lower bound that we identify is that the label rate beta should be bigger than the length scale epsilon squared on which you build the graph. If you have, if the label rate's bigger than this, you get a finite sample size convergence rate. So this is just fixed n. The difference between the graph problem and the PDE is has this rate over here. It's bounded by this quantity. And actually, as as beta goes down to epsilon squared, this rate becomes order one. And so you, you get you get nothing in this case. So this, of course, holds with high probability. Um, and okay, actually, so actually, this is tight. Let's say so. Our, we have a we have a negative result as well, which says that if you take uh, n to infinity and take epsilon n to zero, you take your label rate beta n to zero much faster than epsilon squared, then everything degenerates into a constant function, basically. So uh, this is what the pre-compact in TL2 and convergent subsequences converge to constants. This is what this means. Um, so the uh, summary of the results is that this is a sharp label rate condition that if beta is much bigger than epsilon squared, I get a nice well-posed limit. I can recover my label function. If beta is less than that, I, I get sort of garbage output, let's say. Um, so now that we understand this, let's, 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 let's look at uh, a quick um, experiment on MNIST. If you look at the test error for graph-based learning with Laplacian learning as a function of the label rate, um, you see this similar kind of decay, and if you fit uh, if you fit a polynomial to it, it, it fits very closely to this beta to the minus one half. Basically. And even if you look at the number of neighbors you use in the graph, a smaller number of neighbors, so smaller epsilon length scale, gives you better accuracy, so so lower lower test error. So it fits very well to what our what our theorem says, even though the theorem isn't exactly in the case of classification. We also looked at this for a slightly different model where you only label the points in some boundary strip. Um, and you get a similar result, but the, but the PDE is just uh, the Dirichlet problem now. And uh, I'll leave you if, you, if you, if you want to read these results of the proofs, I'll leave you, I'll leave you to look at our, at our recent uh, archive preprint from this, from this year. This is joint work with Dan Slepchev and with Matthew Thorpe. Um, so I want to talk about the, like, if, if we go below this beta is equal to epsilon squared. So go into the much uh, uh, lower label rate regime, which is, more interesting, what should we do in that regime? Why is Laplace learning so uh, so so poor of a so so bad of a classifier in this regime? And what should we do? Um, so the theorems I showed you before, um, and all of our analysis for Poisson learning, it's all actually based on random walks on random graphs, and it's not based on PDE arguments or variational arguments. So so here, let me just review briefly how um, we. Uh, what random walks on graphs are and, and, and how this connects to Laplace equations. Um, so we'll take a random walk on the vertex, on the vertices of the graph. Um, this means that the transition probabilities going from xi to xj are just the weight wij divided by the degree of xi. Um, and the key computation is that if you take the expected change in uh, u of xk, so take any function you like on the graph and take the expected change in u from one step of the walk to the next, conditioned on the xk minus one, that, and, and this is the generator for the random walk, is that this is just the uh, graph Laplacian I showed you before divided by degree of that node. 
And so this one over degree L uh, is what's often called the random walk Laplacian for the reason that it's, it's, it generates the random walk on the graph. So in particular, if you have a graph harmonic function, LU is equal to zero, um, then, uh, then you have a zero on the right-hand side. And so basically this is the martingale condition for U of XK. Okay, so basically all these techniques are going to be martingale techniques um, because when you have graph harmonic functions, um, they are martingales along random walks. Okay, so if I take the solution to the Laplace learning equation and then take a random walk on the graph and define the stopping time for this walk to be the first time I hit a labeled point. Okay, so that's tau. Um, then, okay, because this is a martingale, um, I can I can apply say I, I can I can apply Dube's optional stopping theorem to to show that um, that u of x that that's u at the first point in the walk it's the same as the expectation of u at the stopping time and that's the expectation of the label vector that I hit and so what you can think is that this formula which is this is just the classical formula for the solution to Laplace equation in terms of Brownian motion or random walks right? but what this says is that u of x it's a weighted average of nearby label vectors, but it's weighted by the probability of a random walk hitting that label vector first. Right? So, for example, if I, you know, the, the way this is uh, supposed to work is that I release a random walker from one of my clusters, and if there's only a small bottleneck or small number of ways to get from one cluster to the other, hopefully the random walk stays in that cluster for long enough to hit a label in that cluster before it moves to the other cluster and hits one of those labels. The problem, though, is that if I have very, very few labels, so here I took a random graph on the box, and I have two labels, a red and a blue label, and the green point is the one I want to label as red or blue. And so I'll use the random walk interpretation of Laplace learning. I release my random walker, it walks around for a while, and then it hits the red point. But I should do this many, many times and average them to get u of x, to get the label. So this one is good. It, it sort of ended quickly and got to the red point. This one took a lot longer and traveled around quite a bit to get to the red point. And this random walk basically explored half the graph. It got very close to the blue point at some point, but then it came all the way back and it ended at the red point somehow. That was very lucky, I think. Um, but this sort of illustrates the problem at low label rates with the random walk interpretation. It's that the random walk takes too long to hit a label. So basically it forgets where it started and it sort of passes the mixing time for the random walk. And so it means that, you know, the label I hit is kind of independent in a probabilistic sense for, of, of where I started the walk. And so this is a bad thing for classification. So we know that if you let the walk, you know, if you, if you let the random walker walk around for a long time, um, we know that the distribution for the walker approaches the invariant distribution for the, for the Markov chain defined by the random walk. And in this case, that invariant distribution is just the degrees of the graph. Um, uh, normalized to be a probability distribution. So this is the probability that I find the random walker at node i after it's walked for a long time. So you can write down that the uh, solution to Laplace learning in the very low label rate regime where it takes a long time for this random walker to hit a label, you're basically averaging the label vectors by the invariant distribution to the random walk. And so you get that u of x is roughly a constant like we saw in all of those images earlier. But we know exactly what the constant is. It's the constant vector that's just the, the weighted average of all the labels, weighted only by the degree of the label. So you trust the ones that have higher degree more than the ones that have lower degree. But what this says for classification is that everything in the graph, it gets the same label. It gets whatever label vector is closest to the C. I put everything in the, in the whole graph into that one class. And so this is why you get catastrophic uh, uh, classification results similar to like random guessing. Okay. So to test this, we looked at a, a shifted version of Laplace learning where we take, um, we take the uh, solution to Laplace learning, we shift it by that constant from the previous slide that this thing will uh, uh, concentrate around. And then we use the same label decision. So all we're doing is this extra shift right here. Um, and this is, makes a huge difference in the classification performance. So it goes from this sort of random guessing 16% and so on up to like low 90s to mid 90s at one to five labels per class. And all we're doing is centering the solution by this, by this constant. 
Um, so when we saw this, we, we, we sort of realized that there was something deeper going on here. I mean, I don't, I don't quite like this approach of just shifting the solution because you could put the shift into the labels. And so it's like you're looking at harmonic extension of the shifted labels, which doesn't really make very much sense. So we, so we thought, you know, there must be some more well-grounded way to interpret what's going on here. Um, and so, right, the, the key computation that we arrived at was that if I'm in this low label rate regime where U is approximately constant with these spikes, um, then actually I can compute the graph Laplacian at the labeled nodes, as well as the unlabeled nodes where it's zero. But at the labeled nodes, I don't know what it should be. But if I just compute it in this case, this is the definition. At a labeled node, U of xi is the label yi. U of xj, all the neighbors are a constant, a c. And so all the j's drop out of here, and I can sum the weights to get the degree. And so actually in this case, I, I know that the Laplacian at a labeled node is just the degree times the centered label vector. At the unlabeled nodes, it's harmonic on the graph, so LU is equal to zero. So you end up with this Poisson equation, is that when, when you're in this low label rate regime where you have these spikes and a constant label function, that, that function should solve this Poisson equation, where you put point sources and sinks on the on the right hand side in place of hard label constraints. So what this says is that there's this there's some kind of connection. This is all sort of heuristic at this point, but there's some kind of connection between hard label constraints and this idea of placing sources and sinks at these labels. Um, so we played with this for a while. We we sort of realized that having these uh, weighting by degree is not really a good idea here. It just it places more trust in the labels that are places of higher degree, which doesn't make so much sense if you have uh, trust in all of your labels because you have very few labels, let's say. So we ended up with a model where we got rid of that degree weighting. Let's just put an equal weighting on everything. Um, and so this is what we call Poisson learning. So we propose that if you're in the low label rate regime, you should replace Laplace learning with Poisson learning. And the difference is in, 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 in place of having hard label constraints at the label points, we place sources and sinks at the label points. Um, so a Poisson equation like this on the graph, it's a, a stationary state for a heat equation. Um, and okay, so uh, the source term on the right hand side, it has to have mean value zero in order for the, the net change in heat to be zero and for there to be a solution to this uh, stationary problem. So that's the role of the centering by y bars so that this term on the right hand side has mean value zero over the graph, which allows there to be, which, which, um, which allows the solution to exist for this. And then for uniqueness, the kernel of the graph Laplacian is non-trivial. The constant functions are in the kernel. And so to specify a unique solution, you have to have some extra condition, which is this condition down here, uh, which is that the weighted average of u is equal to zero weighted by degree. Okay. Uh, the label decision is the same in this case, but uh, you can also easily in Poisson learning account for unbalanced class sizes or, or different numbers of training ex examples in each class just by a simple reweighting of the label decision, which is the same as reweighting the point sources to make them heavier in the classes that have fewer labels and so on. Um, so, right, there's a random walk interpretation um, of Poisson learning, which shows sort of how it's a more well-grounded way to propagate labels at very low label rates. Um, the interpretation is a little different from Laplace learning. Here, the idea is that you release the random walkers from the labeled nodes. There's one random walker for every labeled node. You release them from the labeled nodes. And for each unlabeled node in the graph, you just record every time it's visited by a random walker from one of the labels. You, you record the centered label for that, and you add them all up over every time it gets visited. Um, and if you do this over capital T steps and you send capital T to infinity, you get exactly that this function mu t converges to a solution of our Poisson equation. Um, and actually, you also get that this uh, sequence of functions satisfies a very simple recursion, which looks like a um, discrete heat equation on a graph. And this gives you a very easy way to compute the solution to that Poisson learning equation, which is just you iterate this thing until convergence. Let me say there's also a variational interpretation. Um, I'm going to skip through a little faster, maybe. Um, but like we had for Laplace learning, we had this gradient regularized uh, variational problem with hard label constraints. The, um, the version for Poisson learning is that it's uh, you have some uh, linear loss function that you add 
in place of the hard label constraint. So it's a gradient regularized with a linear loss function here. Um, what's interesting here though is that in, in these problems with a, a, a loss and a regularizer and so on, usually you put a weight like a lambda here and you tune the fidelity term. It actually turns out because of the square and the, and the linear uh, term here, in U, if you put a weight in here, all it does is scale the solution U by the same weight. And so you get the same classification results in the end. So you can drop that parameter. You don't need to have an extra parameter here. So it looks like a small difference, but it makes a huge difference in the performance at very low label rates. It's much better to have this linear loss function in place of the hard constraints or in place of like an L2 loss function or something. Okay, so if you want to read more, this is, this is from our paper in ICML this year, uh, which is joint work with my student uh, Brendan Cook and with Matthew Thorpe and Dan Subchev. And I'll show you some results in the last few minutes of the of the talk, which are also in this in this paper. So let me just say all of this code um, is in uh, is on GitHub as part of a, a package that I've been working on. So let me just plug this package for a little bit. Um, so it's a Python package for graph-based learning, which includes clustering and semi-supervised learning. Um, it implements a, a, a large uh, range of different algorithms, including Laplace learning, Poisson learning, MBO algorithms, all kinds of stuff. And it makes it very easy to implement any of these data sets that we've worked with, MNIST fashion, MNIST CIFAR 10, and so on. You can just sort of, you know, you can play around with it. You can, you can test out new algorithms very easily. Um, so please, please check it out and let me know if you, if you find it useful or if you have questions. Um, so just very briefly, here's the algorithm for Poisson learning. It's very simple to write down. The first few steps are all about you just compute the graph Laplace and you do this uh, centering for the source term. And the main thing is the iteration that I uh, showed you earlier. It's very, very simple matrix vector multiplications. The only thing is L is a, this L is a, uh, is a very large sparse matrix. Um, but you can do it, for example, on a GPU because it's just matrix vector operations. So it takes about one second on a GPU to solve this for MNIST, which is you know 70,000 unknowns basically. Uh, and on a sort of standard laptop, uh, CPU takes about eight seconds to solve this. Um, so we tested on MNIST. We also tested on Fashion MNIST, which is a drop-in replacement for MNIST. So same number of images, same size of images, same number of classes and so on. But the classes are now uh, different items of clothing and the pictures are taken from a, a fashion catalog. Um, and we also tested on CIFAR 10, which is more realistic images from a lot of different classes. Um, this is a much more complicated, harder data set to work with. So for each for each data set, you know, you don't get great results by um, working with the raw pixel values. Uh, so instead, you can apply a feature transformation. You could do a scattering transformation or look at the features from a deep neural network. What we decided to do to make sure we didn't use any label information at all is we trained auto encoders to learn a better representation for the for the image data sets. So auto encoders have an encoding and a decoding phase. They have a smaller latent space and the loss function tries to reconstruct the output uh, uh, as accurately as possible. So we used a, a four layer variational auto encoder with only 30 variables for MNIST and Fashion MNIST. And for CIFAR 10, we used a very recent paper called auto encoding transformations. It's a bit of a different idea about using data augmentation, using a bunch of different transformations to learn an auto encoder that, uh, that has that sort of learns features that are invariant to a group of transformations. So this works really, really well, but it gives a huge latent space with 12,000 different variables. Um, so we build a graph on the latent space. And it's just a, a K is equal to 10 nearest neighbor graph. Um, which is then uh, symmetrized by taking W plus W transpose. And we, um, on CIFAR 10, we found that using the angular metric gave better results, which is the same as, as uh, normalizing the features to have unit norm before doing K nearest neighbors. Um, we compared against a whole slew of different algorithms for graph-based learning. Some of these, like Laplace learning is the one I talked about before, and then graph nearest neighbor is for a baseline. Um, uh, uh, and then let's say the ones that are, have been designed for for low label rate problems are the centered kernel method and the weighted non-local Laplacian and the P Laplacian that I worked on. So this is a paper with my former student, Mauricio. The other methods were not designed for low label rates. And so they perform poorly, but the authors also didn't design them for that for that case. So in, in, the, in, in all these cases, um, Poisson learning performs better than everything else and we can get 90 to mid 90s at, at one to five labels per class on MNIST. 
doing this. Um, and so this is this is the average accuracy over 100 trials where I'm uh, randomizing the labeled versus unlabeled data. And the standard deviation over that 100 trials is in brackets. Um, we see the same kind of performance for fashion endness, but all the results are worse. Um, and this is because it's a much more challenging data set. Uh, you, can com um, you can compare these to the clustering results um, of around 70 or 67.2% uh, in this paper. So we can get around clustering performance at three labels per class, and we can do better than this. And the same kind of uh, results on CFR10, the clustering performance to compare against is around 40% here. So we can match that at one label per class, and we can do better um, up to five labels per class. I'll show some higher label rates uh, shortly. Um, it's not very sensitive to the number of neighbors, so we did some experiments here, and we tried unbalanced uh, training data as well, which 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 worked great. Um, let me just say in the last few minutes, um, the way you can improve these results still is to use volume constraints. So this is to say, you know, I have some prior knowledge about how large each class should be, so I should enforce the final classification to uh, respect those proper class sizes. And so we were in, um, inspired by this paper by Jacobs and Merkajev and uh, Esadoglu, where they did a volume constraint MBO algorithm, uh, which they ended up using for graph-based semi-supervised learning, and they showed very good results on MNIST at very low label rates when you have the volume constraints that all the classes have the same size. So we were thinking about this, and we realized that it fits really well into the Poisson learning framework as well. So the observation is that if I take that iteration for Poisson learning, if I change the time step, which used to be one over degree, so it was like it was an adaptive time step, like a preconditioner. Um, here, if you change it to a fixed time step over the whole graph, then this flow is volume preserving automatically because this thing has mean value zero, the source term has mean value zero, the Plastian has mean value zero. So it's volume preserving, right? So no other flows like this. If you had an L2 uh, fidelity, you, it, it wouldn't be volume preserving. If you, if you fixed the hard label constraints like a Dirichlet problem, you wouldn't have volume conservation either. Um, okay, so then uh, the other observation is that within Poisson learning, you can do a volume constrained label decision quite easily, actually. So the there you can you can add weights like I showed you before, but you can actually tune these weights in the label decision. So if you increase the label the weight SJ for class J, it'll grow the size of class J. If you decrease it, it'll shrink the size. And so we have a very simple sort of gradient descent algorithm for adjusting the weights to get the right uh, class sizes in the end. And so this is the same as reweighting the sources in uh, Poisson learning. And so it's a very simple algorithm. You just alternate the, um, the um, flow for Poisson learning, uh, which is this simple discrete heat equation. You alternate that with the volume constraint label projection. And so we call it Poisson MBO because it's, it's very similar to sort of these uh, merriman benz osher schemes for curvature motion, which have been used in lots of other works and they've been used for graph-based learning as well. So these are, these are uh, schemes that alternate diffusion with some kind of uh, thresholding operation. And so with this, we can get, so here I'm, I'm only going to show the algorithms that performed well. So I'm dropping a lot of the algorithms. And I'm going to go up to higher label rates as well. And you can get much better results um, at the very low label rates by using the volume conservation. So we get like 6% better at one label rate, at, at one label per class. Once you get more labels, the results are not so much different. Um, but we sort of saturate out at like 97.2, it seems, on this one. And uh, we also compare against the uh, volume MBO of, of, of Jacobs et al. And this is probably the most competitive algorithm to what we're doing here. So they get very good results as well. Um, so this is on fashion MNIST. Um, results are very similar. There are some higher label rates where volume MBO or even Laplace learning give the best results. Um, and these are the ones for CFAR 10. So um, that takes me right about to the to the end of the talk. So there's a couple of slides I was going to give on the continuum perspective. Let me just say that this is still ongoing work. You know, the we 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 want to prove that Poisson learning is well posed in the continuum limit, even if I have finite numbers of labels. And so what we expect is that this solution to Poisson learning will converge to a solution of this Poisson equation on a data manifold. But these things are very, they're, they're highly singular. So you have these delta functions on the right-hand side. The solutions here have singularities. And so these, these are sort of harder problems than we've looked at before. So these are still sort of ongoing work. But I think we can sort of 
essentially show rigorously that Poisson learning is stable and well posed at arbitrarily uh, small label rates. So let me just conclude by giving you the references for, um, for the talk. So I talked about these two papers um, and this is the code. Uh, so please feel free to, to grab the code and to play around with it. Um, and I'm uh, very happy to, to answer questions and to, and to chat further. Thanks, Jeff. Very nice talk. Any questions? Oops. Well, I, I, I do have a, a, a few questions. So sure. The, the first question is, because since you, you, you mentioned this uh, like variational PDE point of view, I wonder, like two questions. I wonder if you got a chance to try to go back to, like, say, image um, segmentation. Over there, you have a very low rate of uh, available information in terms of segmentation. Will this give you some very good results? Uh, so, so yes, actually, I didn't talk about this in this talk, but we've used Poisson learning for uh, segmenting a, a, a mesh in three dimensions. So you take like a triangulated mesh um, and you want to segment it into different faces separated by edges, let's say. Um, so in a separate project we're working on about analyzing broken bone fragments, actually we've used this uh, Poisson learning algorithm to, uh, to uh, segment a mesh like this with sort of very minimal supervision. So the user gives a point in each, in each face and then you run semi-supervised learning using Poisson learning to classify or to uh, segment the mesh into different faces. I, I, I haven't tried image processing, like doing image classification, uh -huh. but I think it would work equally well. You'd have to construct a weight matrix over the image. Like people usually do this by looking at difference in, in like pixel patches or something between neighboring points. I think uh -huh. it would work fairly well in this in this setting as well. Yeah. yeah the other thing also related to this, uh, so, when you do the classification, the labeling information or the UX approximate is like a discretized or categorized. But if I'm thinking about if you do the imaging painting, over there you also have a like very limited uh, available information. But now your U, U function UI is like a continuous function. So yeah. will this um, give you something also good? Uh, I don't or know, but analysis will be. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you should really think that the Poisson learning still has the spikes that I that I uh, showed you at the beginning. So you know, it's you know all these point sources. If you look at the solution to Poisson learning, it'll have a sharp spike at the point sources. It might even look you know roughly flat, like it did in the earlier um, examples. But um, because it's sort of uh, centered properly, you get good classification results. Uh -huh. But I don't think it's a good way to like smoothly interpolate a function if it's more like a regression setting or like an in-painting setting where you have to want to smoothly interpolate, I, I, I don't think it'll give you something reasonable here. So in other words, if I change my labels, not just the, just this, 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 this like elementary basis vector, which is all like a one or zero, if yeah. I label it to be a one to three or, or one to nine, like or zero to nine, like I'm data. So this will yeah. you will have some trouble, or is it still. Well, this is this is a bad idea in general for. Yeah, I for, understand it's a bad idea. Image classification. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, I haven't tried it. Sort of the, the the problem is, yeah, you don't want any of your label vectors to be linearly dependent. So you don't want like two of them to average out to a third label vector. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, so, I, I, agree, I agree with that. I mean, it might be, might be okay, but you might get weird results where, you know, I mean, of course, your results will be dependent on the ordering you take for the... Yeah, for yeah the, they're not equally traded. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 I see. I see. I see. I see. I see. Yeah, the, the, the other thing... Um, um, so, as you, as you mentioned, because when, when you do the classification, right, the function you approximate is... Uh, not continuous, but like sort of piecewise. Yes. Yeah. Would that be make more sense? Like you mentioned the PLAN function. Let's say you use the Alwana function, like total variation type of thing. Then you also do this kind of shifting. Would that give you something even better? Or that's... Yes. So in in some sense, the thing I showed you at the end, the Poisson MBO, it's an approximation to a total variation oh, okay. problem. Right, which I, I, I didn't talk about much, but the but the MBO scheme, yeah, it does approximate total variation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so this is kind of what's going on here. Um, 
Although, I mean, you know, there's there's not so much of a difference here. Like if you if you think to image processing, you know, there's a huge difference between L2 and L1 because because there, you know, if, if you take an L2 regularizer, it, it like destroys the edges, everything, you know, completely smoothed out in all directions. You take an L1 regularizer, you can preserve sharp edges and everything, right? There's 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 no there's no uh, yeah there's no way to argue that L2 is good for image processing. Like yeah. there's you know, L1 much bigger than L2 for image processing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think for data science, it's not so clear that there's that much of a difference. And the and the and the reason is that if you think back to the slide I gave a while ago. Uh, L2 in data science is not really the same as the Laplacian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it has this extra row. So where was that slide I gave? Um, so here. So the L2 in data science, it's approximating this weighted Laplacian. So you have this sort of edge detector built in, and it's exactly what you'd want it to be. It's the density. So you can allow sharp edges, even in, in, even in these L2 models, you can allow sharp edges in regions where the density is small, and that's what you what you want out of a classification algorithm. So I think there's not as big of a difference between L1 and L2 in data science as there is in in image processing for this for this reason. Yeah, but to me, this sort of also depends on this sampling or density quality of your of your data manifold. So sure. if you sort of like you have the, you have a data manifold, you have a different pieces of data manifold. If you force like piecewise continues on top of data manifold. And here is like, you, you, you hope the, 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 the unsupervised part, the data manifold I can already tell you the, 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 the difference between edge. But if there's no such a thing, I don't know, yeah. I mean, yeah, there, there, there could be, like, like you can think about like the piecewise constant or piecewise smooth Mumford Shaw, piecewise constant Mumford Shaw kind of things, right, where you, yeah, where you where you look, you sort of uh, take the onsets that your that your classifier is in the piecewise constant or piecewise smooth um, uh, space of functions. Um, I I don't know if anyone's looked closely at this kind of thing in, in data science. I know there's there's maybe a paper by Dan Slepchev looking at the, like uh, Mumford Shaw for 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 data science applications, but more theoretical, just looking at large data yeah. limits and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there could be something potentially here that could be could be interesting. Yeah. I think. But, Any, any, any more questions? I, I don't know what the protocol for asking questions is. Do we just jump in? You just jump in. Yeah. So just a, this is probably just a little uh, fuzzy point, and I think it's just a heuristic, but um, at some point when you were computing the Laplacian at the labeled nodes, the graph Laplacian at the labeled nodes, you were approximating the values of u at the neighbors by c, and I didn't quite understand that. I didn't quite understand. I would have thought in the vicinity of the labeled, you would have sort of a local deviation far from the approximate constant solution. Um, yes. So uh, this this is just a heuristic, like you were saying. Um, but we find if if you if you actually look at the graph closely. Um, there is a second order variation in like the nearest neighbor neighborhood, but it's sort of the next order term in the series. It's very, very small. So for all purposes, it, it actually is very, very close to a constant in the even at the nearest neighbors. Um, but if you look closely and sort of zoom in, you see this like second order behavior where there's a small variation in there too. Yeah. So this is this is sort of not exact, but it, to us, it just sort of justified, you know, why we should be looking for Poisson equations. Um, I think I would, I would say the more rigorous way to think about the Poisson equation is through this random walk interpretation that I, right. that I gave later. Yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? So if I may, I, can I ask one more question, Jeff? Sure, of course. Yeah. So the other question is in terms of metric, the WIJ uh, uh, you are using. I mean, to me, it seems like the, the metric is a, another very critical component when you do this, when you build up the graph, and this will basically determine the data manifold structure. So as you yep. mentioned, you use the autoencoder to, to, to sort of extract the intrinsic variables and build up that. Uh, so all the all the method you compare is based on this uh, 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 graph. Uh, you build up the graph based on the latent latent space. Yep. I see. 
I see. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, all the methods are, are coded up in our Python package. So we tested them all on the exact same graphs and everything, right? Um, you can get, so let's let's say with the autoencoders, you don't you don't need them for MNIST and fraction MNIST. Like you can use the raw pixel values even for, 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 for these two data sets and get only slightly worse results. You can use uh, basic transformations like the uh, scattering transformation or the SIFT features. So you can use sort of pre-hard-coded features for MNIST fashion MNIST that works pretty well. Um, we found for harder data sets like CIFAR 10, nothing like that worked. Like even using like a, a SIFT features or a scattering transformation for CIFAR 10, it, it gave terrible results like, uh, you know, 20% accuracy or something. So yeah, we really, that. yeah, we needed for uh, CFR 10, we really needed the autoencoder to learn a much better representation for the data. Yeah, I can imagine that because because the the, the, the intensity is just not a good uh, way to, no. to compute the distance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but even these things like uh, scattering transform and SIFT features, which are uh, supposed to be invariant to all these to pixel levels or to, to transformations and so on, they don't even work that well. For these, for these yeah, but they are like just the, like the linear transformation round. There's some uh, other the scattering transformers more has some nonlinear aspects to it, right? So it's almost like a two or three layer neural network or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's been a lot of work trying to replace convolutional parts of networks by scattering transforms, but I don't, it, and the people can get fairly good results like this, but not as not yeah, as good yeah, as, yeah. Exactly. as a full. Yeah, like full. a lot of submission. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. 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 That makes sense. That makes sense. The, 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 how, how about you just say, so basically the, 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 uh, the overall model is, is, a, is, a, is a, like a variation of P version of the, of the Poisson equation. So would that be possible like you do some kind of learning type of thing to <laughs> improve the operator you're using? Um, to improve the operator? So you're um, basically Laplacian, right? Yeah. So, so right. Um, I think there's an opportunity to learn the graph better. And I mean, the, of course, the graph comes into the operator because it's the graph. Yeah, yeah. Part, that's, right? that's, yeah, that's sort of what so, it is. Sort of, so, yeah, like more interactive way. Yeah, so we have this feed forward thing where we you know, train the autoencoder and then that gives you the graph and then you just yes. apply the graph based learning. But if you close the loop back around and sort of have some kind of feedback loop where you, where you sort of train the neural network at the same time as, as solving the graph problem, I think this can give you better results. And there are some works uh, along these lines. So one person who does this is um, Carola Bibiane uh, Sean Lieb from Cambridge. She has some papers where they mm -hmm. they sort of combine deep learning with graph-based learning in, in this way. So you try to learn the learn the weight matrix uh, you know on the fly sort of as you're as you're training or something. Yeah. Um, I think this has some some good promise as well. This this could give you know, uh, like all these graph-based algorithms are only as good as the as the weight matrix you give them. If it's not a good representation of the similarities between data points, you're not going to get good results. If you can improve the weight matrix, you get much better results. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Okay, any, any other questions? So if no more questions, let's thank uh, Jeff again for the wonderful talk. So then we stop here. So we'll meet. Uh, so we won't have a we won't have a talk next week, but we'll, we'll meet again the week after next week. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I'll meet you. Uh, hope I can meet you in a different.